everybody. Hello. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me, as always, are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, it's Diana. Hi, hi, it's Jackie. Hi, everybody. And we're back for another full-length episode. Uh, this is ABA Inside Track, as I said right at the top, which is a podcast in which we discuss behavior analytic research articles. And typically that's around a theme. However, at one point we decided, hey, let's just pick three random articles, one that we each chose that we just think sounds cool to talk about. And that became our research grab bag. And then we said, hey, since we did that on episode 12, let's just do that every 12 episodes. And since 48 which is this episode, is a multiple of 12. Guess what? It's our fourth research grab bag, grab bag. episode. So in to this week's episode, we're just going to each be talking about an article on a random topic that is not related to any specific theme. It's just something that we saw in the journals and said, hey, this looks fun to discuss. It's something that interests us on a personal level. And that's that's it. That's the show. That's what we'll be doing this week. So hold on to your butts. I'm holding on. And wow, that was a quick intro. Usually we go longer. I don't know. <laughs> Just kind of getting into it. We're moving. We're jumping. I guess we got three articles. Sometimes that's hard to get through three in the in our, our, our target time frame. It's true. So why don't, without further ado, let's reach into the old, the ye old grab bag where we've printed out every article ever made, ever, and we reach into it. And then after every uh, one of these, we throw them all away. And then we'll, we'll have to reprint them out, though, 12 episodes from now. So it's very wasteful. <laughs> So, Jackie, you said you wanted to go first. So, I why do. don't you reach into the grab bag and pick out pick out the article? We're very high tech here. Oh, I've got it. The article that I've chosen is very applicable to this time of life as it is the end of January, the beginning of February. I've chosen an article called Improving Accuracy of Portion Size Estimations Through a Stimulus Equivalence Paradigm. Whoa. Yes. Topical. <laughs> Very topical for all you New Year's resolutioners out there that you want to eat healthy, be better. That's how you're doing. Right. How maybe are you're you doing? just <laughs> barely hanging on the bandwagon, right? right? Like this maybe you only have a little finger hold left <laughs> on there and the rest of you is like running cookies? behind the bandwagon <laughs> yeah. trying to get back on maybe this will help yeah so i thought it was fun actually i was looking through the little table of contents of all the java articles in this one i was like "Ooh, i could learn how to do this because i'm pretty <laughs> sure i overestimate all of my food um and so you can find this article in the journal of applied behavior analysis in 2014 Great. Yeah. So I was really perusing the table of contents all the way back to 2014. Nice. Portion yeah. sizes. That's, who are that's the authors? The big, oh, sorry. Oh, authors. Sorry. I've actually never. <laughs> this is the first time. This is an ABA Inside Track first that I have introduced my own article. Oh, wow. So I, don't, oh. I don't know how to do it. Okay. <laughs> so the, ar the authors are Nicole Hausman, John Barrero, Alyssa Fisher, and Sue Khan. That's that. That's there you go. I did it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll be back next week. So I thought this was very interesting, and I thought to myself, hmm, I could use this. Portion control seems like one of the pieces, and, and if, please quiet me down if it's in the intro and the authors say it better, but sure. when you're talking about nutrition and diet, the issue, I think, for a lot of people is not so much that we have no idea what foods we should eat, but we don't actually know how much of any one type of food to eat because you know i'll i'll be like i'm gonna i'm gonna have a bowl of cereal and i just pour the cereal until it's at the you know over the top and then i put the milk in i'm like it's probably a little over but i'm guessing if i actually measured it out it would be like crazy over like it's three servings of cereal so yeah. you're not even close to identifying how many calories you just took in for no reason it there. is true yeah so the authors in the introduction really talk about how obesity is a is an epidemic in the united states and other um, developing countries most people in the united states have a higher than normal body mass index which will con contribute to being overweight and being obese um, and it is this it's not that people aren't moving or aren't exercising because they actually are what they did when they did the research they're saying that everyone is actually exercising is moving around but the amount of food that people are eating is astronomical so that's a bummer i really I like no me too <laughs> And I, I can see this because, like, isn't it 
the case that you have a friend, a.k.a. me, <laughs> and I'm talking to you, I'm like, I just don't know why I'm not losing weight. I mean, I'm running. I'm do- lifting weights. And then I like go home and eat like an entire box of spaghetti. Mm. I'm like, that's one portion. <laughs> right. So I think this is a it's a very applicable because who knows? Like, like unless you have a scale at your house. Yeah. Right. Like, do you actually know what a portion's like? What the oh, that kind of scale? Is? I yeah, oh, like a, a scale? like a kitchen scale to yeah. weigh out your dry foods. To like, my mom used to have a spaghetti holder, and the top of it had you could turn the dial, and it had different size holes based mm. on how many portions of spaghetti you need. Just to bring up the spaghetti example. Oh, well, there you go. Mm-hmm. I need that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Goldfish tell you how many servings they are by the pieces of goldfish. So that's helpful. If I can count it out, but I can do usually you? do portion size. No, I but could. Do you? I'm saying I could. Yeah. But, but I have most a sense like don't. twelve goldfish equals this many. Oh, okay. So I got probably, you know, ten per handful. So if I eat ten handful, at least I have a sense of what I want to do. Anything in weight or if I have to know like an approximate size, like how many inches, like I have no clue. Right. No idea. And this is also a real problem, not so much when you're at home because you could use a measuring cup, you mm-hmm. could count something out, right? You could use that scale, you could use, well, I did like the 21 day fix thing where they give you the little bottle, like the little like cups and they're different, oh, yeah? they're different colors. Now I use them for my daughter's daycare, <laughs> but before <laughs> I was using them to put like, you put like carbs in the yellow oh. one and protein in the red one. You get like, depending oh. on mm-hmm. you. You, you get so many of the each of the boxes. So that yeah. was trying to curb like the portion control. Oh, but when it's clever. It's a neat idea. It's very clever, yeah. But when you go to a restaurant, yeah. Like you're not like divvying stuff up and putting them in little boxes. You're not bringing your scale. Like let's all <laughs> imagine that we're going yeah. to the Olive Garden. Right? Yeah. Those are one Those time. are ridiculous they, portions. They're <laughs> ridiculous, right? So you could eat those for like an entire week. Right, yeah. Um, those like one pasta, I think I looked it up once, it was like 1,300 calories. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's bad. When they put the, cal- yeah. well, the calorie markers that they put on food, I think they did that in New York, and they've been looking at the results, and they don't actually seem to be changing anyone's behavior. They don't, it's not, no. it's Oh, not really? A, it's not a useful nudge. But, you know, I think about it when I look at them. It just, But it just makes me sad. It doesn't sometimes i'll pick something different <laughs> but it's not like you look at it and you're like oh well i'm here at the burger place and everything's a thousand calories so i guess i'll go home now it's like <laughs> no you're like ooh, I I'll, I'll buy oh, it, but well, I don't eat want. less later yeah yeah, yeah. so we, we i don't eat dinner we, but you always eat dinner of course you're gonna yeah. eat dinner they do say that uh it's unusual like if you talk about the typical weight loss systems like 21 day fix or like weight watchers you have to like measure your food out know what your portion sizes get used to it when you're out eating at a restaurant, you don't necessarily like pull your scale up no. and be like, okay, I'm going to measure out how, how much of this pasta I'm going to eat. <laughs> and so that's where they came up with this idea um, is how could we use stimulus equivalents, the, the stimulus equivalents paradigm to teach people how to recognize what portion sizes are. So they have, they have measuring cups as one of the stimuli. They have the actual food as one of the stimuli, and then they have like a what they call a portion size measurement aid. Okay. And so that's like the aid like it would be like sometimes people are like, you should only eat the size of your fist. Yeah. Mm. Like that's an example of one. Yeah. Um, or so like they, the size of the palm of your hand is a serving of protein, like f- chicken right. or fish. Yeah. Yeah. So those are... Does that include my fingers or just the circle no, part No, the of my palm. Hand? No, just the palm. Okay. Yeah. But I always pretend my fingers are so long. <laughs> I can eat more fish. Um, I don't even like fish. But yeah, so they use these it's portions... It's all a lie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these portion size measurement aids. And they wanted to see if they taught the relation between the measuring cups, the, the portion size measurement aids, or the PSMA is what they're calling them, and then the actual food portion... If then given a novel food, could people accurately say which was the portion size? Which is kind of interesting. What a clever idea. Yeah. The sad thing that that I wasn't really prepared for is that it's translational. This is a mm. translational research. I was mm-hmm. thinking that they were going out in the field, like we were going to Olive Garden <laughs> um, to see if it works, but it's not. So this is very translational. It's in the laboratory. They only use a limited amount of food. So there's like Cheerios egg noodles crackers Mm -hmm. it's only dry food it's only a single food 
yeah. and not like a blended food. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's something to note. And we must proceed with caution there, okay. right? So we got to start somewhere. I know. I just was, I don't know. I just, when I was started, they didn't have that in the, in the abstract. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm going to learn something. And I did learn something, but I was just like, oh, it's translational. And I know we need translational research, <laughs> but I really was hoping this one would be like a applied. And then we took them to McDonald's and they ate, you know, they could accurately pick a serving size out of that hamburger. Yeah, they didn't. And then they did, which I think is nice, a one-week maintenance um, one week maintenance session, and then they did an extension sessions where they use novel foods. Cool. Like, like I told you. Okay. Yeah. The dependent variable was the accuracy of the portion size estimations during baseline training, maintenance, and the exten- uh, extension sessions. What they did is they had every, they measured all of the food, like they said a half a cup of food. They pick this half a cup of food. They weighed it like a thousand times. They really weighed it like twice, but then <laughs> ten times, like twice. Right, which rounds up to a thousand. It's like sure. a thousand times. So the Cheerios, one half cup portion was 12.5 grams. The egg noodles was 20.3 grams. The mini saltine crackers was 24.2 mm, grams. Those like oyster crackers. Yeah, they're oh really God, good. I love those. So they had these, they had the half cup. Then they weighed them um, to make sure that the, the weight was mm-hmm. accurate. Then what they did was they wanted to look at the deviation from what the actual portion size was. So that was the measure on their graph. Okay. So how they did that was they took the target measurement, which I just told you that 12.5, 20.3, and 24.2. They divided it by the target measurement, what the person actually said. And then converted that result to a percentage. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you could either get it spot on, which most people didn't. Um, You could overestimate or underestimate. So they looked at it and they said, that's a half cup? Or they told them, go get a half cup Cheerios? Well, it's going to depend on what the set, what they're training. Okay. At the end, that's what they're going to do. Okay. At the end, they're going to say, like, the the crackers, can you give me a half cup of crackers? Okay. Right? And mm-hmm. then they weighed it, but they didn't show them the weight. <laughs> I'd be like, does, it, does all the ones in my mouth count? <laughs> right. <laughs> Wait, what about all the ones I ate? <laughs> so does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So they had nine undergraduate students participate. And what I found was interesting that I probably would not want to be part of this study is that they took their height and their weight and they calculated their BMI. So you have both people that are underweight, healthy weight. We have one obese person. We have some overweight people based on their BMI, um, but they like put it in the, the table. Like imagine being that one female that is 21 years old that is the only obese person in this study. Like, yeah, that's just sad. I know. I know that they're looking at that, but man. What does that have to do with, I guess, are they later gonna... on? They, okay. talk, they okay. try to extrapolate something from it, Okay, but it doesn't matter. They have participants. They don't have names. They just have numbers. Um, They tell you the gender. There are four females and five males. They range in age from 19 to 23. Um, And they have, they have, they calculated their BMIs and they told us their weight status. So most, we have a a mix. We have one obese person, one underweight person. The underweight person was a 19 year old male. He probably just grew. Right. right? He's probably probably just like, whoop, growth spurt. (laughs) Um, And then we have some healthy weight, three healthy weight people and four overweight people. Okay. And one obese person. Okay. Man. I'm just thinking to myself, like, that would be the worst. I know. One obese person. So they use a non-concurrent multiple baseline design. And because there was nine participants, they divide the participants into three data sets, which I thought was pretty clever. When I read it, I uh, did not understand what they were talking about. But when you go look at the graph, so they just put each three participants in a, a... like one graph so that then we wouldn't have one participant in baseline forever right sure okay. yeah. yeah that makes complete sense yeah um so yeah so most people were in baseline a minimum of two to four times i okay. think yeah so then the inter-observer agreement what they did was they calibrated the scale they looked at the scale <laughs> they hit tear they hit the tear. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> they uh research assistant poured the portion size of the target target food on a plate 
place the plate onto the scale, and then both of them, the uh, observers independently recorded the measurement, and the plate was removed, the scale was reset, and they did it again, just to make sure. I love that, that they did it again. They got 100%. <laughs> um, calibration agreement good job across 120 trials aka 1 million because that's so yeah. many trials so in baseline they had five trials in baseline and they just asked the participants the participants to estimate one half cup of particular food so that's what okay that's mm. what they're looking for so they just had a large plastic container filled with food the participants were instructed to go to the food get one half a cup like pour it out on a paper plate and then they gave the paper plate to the research assistant, and the research assistant weighed it. So the participants did not see the weight. No. So they did that later. Or, they or did they it right did... there, but they okay. like hid it. Okay, so behind a yeah, they were like or something. They were like, "Do not look at this weight." So I like that. And then they they did the mean portion size for each session because they had five trials. So in baseline, they were supposed to estimate. One half cup of Cheerios without any aids. So just go get one half cup of Cheerios. Hmm. Um, do you think you guys could do I, that? That's what I'm trying to imagine right now. Half cup, I uh, think I'm pretty good, actually, because no. I do a fair amount of measurement for cooking. But I'm I might horrible. not be. Yeah, I don't think. I mean, I'd be maybe. like, it's never no as much as you think. The whole box. Is that one half cup? <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, I can imagine it. And I can imagine it, a cup and half cup. I'm using my fingers, so you can't see this at home. It's like here and about that much. But then I can't translate it to yeah. what I would see in a measuring cup to what it would look like on a on a paper plate. Yeah. I'm not very good at this. As an anecdote, um, I was in my center um, at my school when I was working with some kids, and I was unaware of a specific serving size for children, oh. ages <laughs> two to four. Um, and so I was giving them all of the graham crackers <laughs> and then I was informed, oh yeah, they should only have one. And I was like, what? They had like seven. Um, so that's another reason why I probably needed to read this because I need to know portion size. Um, yeah. So that's what they did in baseline. Nobody was great at it. So that just kind of okay. tells us something, right? That we we're not College great kids are not good at <laughs> portion sizing. <laughs> yeah. Well, or I'm probably not that good either. I'm like, how good it. did you have to be? Within 20%. Okay. I would definitely not have done well. So then uh, they started doing training. So the first, so each training session consisted of 10 trials. And they had a sample and then they had the comparisons of four, four uh, stimuli. Um, I think they were just out. They don't specify like where they were, but I'm pretty sure they're probably just an array of four. All of the measuring cups were clear plastic, and they could hold two cups. So then you could see where, mm -hmm. you know, where they were at. I love that I just made the little line thing with my hand, but you can't see that. So they were given feedback during each trial if they were right or wrong during training. Um, and if they got 90% correct or more or better, they could move on to the next section. So what they first taught was matching foods to measuring cups. So here they were asked to indicate the proper portion size of dry food. So they use cereal, noodles, goldfish crackers, popcorn. Um, and they had a plate that had a single portion of food. And they were supposed to like match it up with the measuring cups. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So they yeah. had four identical ma measuring cups. One half cup, one cup, two cups with, with food in it. Okay. Guess. Okay. No, that makes sense? There, yeah, there were three values? Yeah. Okay. There was four values. Quarter cup? Quarter cup. Okay. Yeah. Missed that one. Because it's so little. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. It's I'm definitely hilarious. not enough goldfish. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> it's like three goldfish. So then during section two, they switched it and did matching measuring cups to food. So same thing, right? And then mm -hmm. this is section three is when they added in the... PSMAs. What did that stand for again? Portion size measuring assistant. Aid. Aid. Right. Okay. So this is another place where I would have deviated a little bit if this was my research. So they used balls. So like a golf ball, a tennis ball, a baseball, or a softball um, to deviate, to talk mm -hmm. about the different portion sizes. That would be really hard to translate 
clinically, right? Can you imagine if I'm at the mall and I'm like, here's my tennis ball of food and I have like a bag of balls <laughs> and I like pull them out. So they gave a lot of really good examples in the introduction about like using your hand, using yeah. your arm, using like body parts or things that, you know, mm -hmm. you have on hand that wouldn't be super stigmatizing. Mm -hmm. But then they went with the balls because like, they said that balls are like everyday objects. But, but not in a restaurant. But not They're in not. a restaurant, yeah. right? But everyone, I guess they wanted to control for like different hand size, you know? Yeah, that's true. Because if you true. said, oh, it's the size of your fist, that, that's different for everyone. Yeah. And you could learn that for yourself, for your own body, and it would be consistent. But across right. yeah. different people. Yeah, no, that's be. true. Um, clinically, though, I understand why they did it. Clinically, though, because I was in the mindset of like, I want to be able to do this tomorrow when I go yeah. to the Olive Garden. Mm -hmm. I'm probably not going to bring my baseball. Right. Um, but maybe I will. You never know. <laughs> you need your bowling ball size of food. <laughs> Lug that around. So they did that during section three. They matched the aids to the measuring cups, which makes sense. And then during section four, they matched the measuring cups to the aids. And so in section five, they tested the untrained relations. So here's where you're looking for if they have a plate of food, can they select the appropriate ball that matches the size? Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. And then they also were given the ball okay. and asked. They did it both ways. Uh -huh. So the plate of food, and then they said, what size ball? Yep, or a ball. They were given a ball and say, what size plate of food? Mm -hmm. Okay. Both. And they were not allowed to ball up the food, I'm guessing. No, they weren't allowed to ball well, up the dry food. Goods, dry so goods. Dry goods. couldn't yeah. really. They were in the yeah, you're right. It yeah. wouldn't work. Ball it up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, those Cheerios and goldfish and popped popcorn. Pop popcorn would be hard though because it's got it's like not a, it's a weird shape. Mm. Well, you mm -hmm. can have a lot of popcorn. Like a cup of popcorn is not really that much popcorn because it just takes up so much space. Right. Yeah. So the serving sizes for popcorn are usually big. Mm. Good. The yeah. whole bag. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and so after the training, participants were asked to estimate a one half cup portion size without using any aids. Yeah. So that's the post training probes. And then one week later, they asked them again with the maintenance. And then they did extension probes where they asked the participant to estimate portion size of novel foods such as egg noodles and crackers. So it's important to know that the egg noodles were dry. Mm hmm. Right. Um, yes. And so this was a problem. I think they picked these egg noodles before, and then nobody could estimate the egg noodles. Spoiler alert. Um, oh, yeah. And one of their hypotheses is that you don't usually measure egg noodles when they're dry, but when they're wet. Like, that's your experience of egg noodles hmm. when they're wet. You know, when they're cooked, I guess, not wet. They're kind of a funny shape. So yeah. I can see how, like, spread out on a plate, it, it, it would be difficult to mm. estimate. Right. Because they fit together weird in a cup. If you that, that's not like they're uh, making an assumption about, well, they had trouble with the skill that they learned with this item because they're used to seeing the item in a different format. But it's the same skill. So I would say it more would have to do with the fact that it's just an odd shape and it's just human human perception of that shape is very it's just yeah inaccurate in, in its estimation. Yeah. Well, we now know that it, it might not necessarily work across all dry foods. Mm -hmm. Right. I wish they had tested like <laughs> what soup, <laughs> lasagna, right? Tacos. <laughs> I know tacos would be very hard. Yes. So they give some tables that I'm not going to necessarily go over, but if you're interested in raw data, then they show the graphs are fun. So I'm just going to talk to you about one graph. Okay. Um, because they have three data sets. Remember for mm -hmm. three participants. I'm going to talk about Figure Two. Um, so they have this multiple baseline design. The range is three data points to six data points in baseline. So we have a stack of baseline. But remember, it's not concurrent. Mm -hmm. And then they're just looking at the deviation from the target. So yeah. that's the y-axis. So zero on the y-axis means that they had matched perfectly one half cup. And then it goes from like 20, 40, 60, 80. And when it goes up, that's an overestimate. So it's more than the one half cup. And if it's below minus 20, minus 40, minus 60, that is an underestimate. Okay. So they hypothesized that it might be better to underestimate because then your portion size are smaller, mm -hmm. which would not contribute to the obesity ep epidemic. So it's better to underestimate than to overestimate. But they didn't tell anyone that. That was just their yeah. idea. <laughs> um, so in baseline, everyone 
was very inconsistent. Participant 174, vastly underestimated. Participant 201, grossly overestimated, so 60% deviation from the target. Oh, man. Basically. That would be me. Yeah, me too. Mine would be like 120%. <laughs> Uh, and then participant 178 was all over the place. So both underestimated and overestimated. But during post-training, so after they ran stimulus equivalents, mostly everyone was in within the target 20% of a, under an overestimation. And most of them stayed that way during maintenance, except for participant 201, who o- overestimated a little bit. Mm. Um, and then following one week, when they had the noodles, participant 174 grossly overestimated the noodles and so did participant 178 um so they like was like up into a hundred percent oh yeah deviation from the target so they were like egg noodles we don't eat those but when they did i don't know i'm trying to figure out why yeah but when they did the crackers the crackers fell within that 20 percent deviation i think egg noodles dry egg noodles just don't fit well into a measuring cup right so it's hard to tell how much is going to fit mm-hmm. right and all three of participants in set two in the extension did not they all overestimated the egg noodles but did not with the crackers hmm. so that's pretty interesting I, mean, I guess it could be something with the do that uh, not quite density but the yeah like you were saying diana the amount of space the amount of space taken up by the egg noodles the is, volume is just, yeah the volume there we go is just going to be different Seems like the clear solution is banning egg noodles. Yeah, just take egg noodles out of our life. Yeah, and but then I we'll all be fine. Them. Yep. Or change change them. Change them so they're more fittable in a measuring cup. <laughs> we found the root of the problem. Yeah, we have. <laughs> Everything should be measuring cup size. So they found that using the stimulus equivalence paradigm, we can accurately teach people to figure out portion sizes if it's not egg noodles, but if it's like... <laughs> all other dry food in in a controlled laboratory setting but they again we should be tentative because these results were not tested out later on right and we don't know either that if we had good portion size of food would that then contribute to a healthier lifestyle who knows right we don't have those well, data it, you would right. have you would most likely have less caloric intake because if you were told you should only have this many portions of well, I guess pasta right. wouldn't yeah, be good yeah but who follows noodles. those rules well, it wouldn't. Nec- no, it just you would at least be able to say this is probably this many portions. Therefore, if I eat more than that, I'm probably eating more calories than I should. It's not. It's not an exact. It wouldn't be an exact science in that respect, though, because again, yeah, I know it's two portions, but I don't care. I'm gonna eat it. That's a that's a different issue. Right. So what they did say too is that so they had everyone's BMI, right? So mm-hmm. they predicted that the people that were healthy. BMIs would more accurately predict the portion sizes, and that was not the case. Yeah, yeah. So um, I thought that was interesting. That that they seems like making a prediction based more... on one factor when there are so many factors related. Oh to yeah, absolutely. Weight. I think your history with measurement is probably more a factor. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they don't know if this would actually be applicable in real life, but it is a good first step. And they really only did this one target portion size, right? So hopefully we're all eating more than one half cup of something in our lives. It depends on what that something is. Yeah, that's true. So my big question from this would be, great, that seems like a lot of work to teach people to identify portion sizes. And then we're, we, we've already kind of talked about a couple of reasons that just identifying portion sizes wouldn't necessarily equate to a healthier BMI. So as much as this sounds like the kind of research of, man, if I knew that, I feel like everything would be better for me in regards to to diet. Maybe it really wouldn't be because it's so limited. And, you know, trying to think is, would there be a, you know, you have to look at so many other factors to say, Mm -hmm. well, you did the dry foods. Like this wouldn't be useful unless it was, well, no, no, no. Take my, you know, one hour course on portion sizes and you'll be able to, you know, measure within, let's say 30%. or You know, so, so not even quite as good. All types of foods, because it's more than that, no one's going to do it. It's like, oh, you got to take a college course on portion size to do your wet foods, your dry foods, your mixed foods. Your... And it was 30 sessions, so yeah, it wasn't no, short. No one's going to do that. But they're also not going to be doing like, this is 30 sessions with baseline post-training maintenance extensions. Yeah, you, right. you, could, you, could, you would do less right, if you, you were actually doing do the, the training. Yeah, But I don't know. I, I think there is more 
but this is a nice place to start, right? So if you're like, oh man, I am like 50 pounds in the hole, like I need, I need to change something, this might be a place to start. Portions it's a place. good thing to think about. It's a good factor to consider. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to change your world like completely, right? Just because you eat a little less, it's not going to mean you're like the fittest, healthiest person alive. You're going to have to do other things. Oh, I feel like it'd be easier to get into an exercise routine I agree. than learn how to estimate <laughs> portions. <laughs> I actually think so too, you know, but forget we don't it. I'm, know. Just go, I'm just going to start running. It's so much easier. We don't know. I can I can measure a mile on my, you know, my wrist watch, my smart watch. But you, you can know. run. Some people can't run. Some people don't have access. Maybe all they have is <laughs> stuck, balls. A, stuck in a room with nothing but dry <laughs> egg noodles. Dry egg don't noodles know and how to get the right balls. portion. Um, but what's, anyway, what's the Lord of the Rings quote, Rob, from Gimli? Bring, he was like, "Bring your pretty face to my." No, axe. he was like, "We're not built for speed." <laughs> oh, dwarves! <laughs> dwarves aren't built yet. Yeah. Dwarves are good sprinters. Yeah, <laughs> we're not we're not made for for cross country and yeah. long distance. Yeah, I. I understand where he's coming from yeah so one thing i love about this article is that this would be a perfect uh, article to extend yeah Mm -hmm. right so it's translational it was great uh but sad for me because i thought i was gonna be able to like take this home and go to olive garden not eat my whole life my whole week's worth of calories but i think it's a really great one to, to keep by your bedside if you're ever feeling like you want to do some research, that may be beneficial. Yeah. It's a bedside read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. So this seems like a good time uh, for those of you who are listening for continuing education credits. ABA Inside Track is actually an ACE approved podcast. So by listening and by going to the website, abainsidetrack.com or clicking the link in the info section of your podcast player, you can purchase CEs from us. But you're going to need to know a few things, specifically two code words hidden throughout this episode so that you can prove that you totally listened to our whole fun episode. And the first of those code words is going to be Danson, D-A-N-S-O-N, like Ted Danson, the guy from Cheers and that other show, Becker. Remember that? Everyone remember Becker? No. No? No one remembers Becker. Okay. He's on TV now, too. He's on uh, The Good Place on NBC. Danson. We are not sponsored by him. We're not sponsored by Ted Danson, unfortunately. Just thinking of him. Danson. All right, Diana, so you're next. Why don't you pick out your article from our our big grab bag here? Okay. Oh, okay, I got it. I got it. Uh, This article is called Teaching Conversational Speech to Children with Autism Spectrum Disorder Using Text Message Prompting. And this is by Grossberg and Charlop from Java 2017. Excellent. Newbie. Tell us about it. I will. Uh, So this is, uh, I thought this was a cool article because it took a really difficult topic, which is attempting to teach conversational speech uh, to individuals with autism. And it applied a nice new twist on it by using a text message as the textual prompt. The advantage of this was triple fold. First, texting is cool. They mentioned that. In How the, old were the kids? Uh, six to ten. Okay. Six-year-olds would be weird, right? Well, they weren't using the phone to text at other times. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Mom, where's just, my milk? Just for this purpose. But they mentioned that amongst young people and adolescents, texting is a cool thing <laughs> or something uh. like that. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Additionally... Using a phone as a method of prompting is somewhat inconspicuous. That's true. Right? And sort of an appropriate type of prompt that many people use. So they considered that a bonus. And then the third bonus of using the text as the prompt is that the prompting can change momentarily depending on the situation. Oh, I like that. Yeah. yeah. It still weirds me out that the kid's six, though, because I don't usually see a six-year-old walking around with a phone. No. Do I? I mean, when they're like waiting for Sometimes things. Sometimes you do. At a store maybe. But no, <laughs> it's not, not that common an occurrence. They have a phone. Most six-year-olds don't have a phone, I don't think. Maybe I'm behind the times. Maybe well, it's cool They all now. use their mom's phone. Oh, okay. In the study, additionally. So they didn't have their own phone. You have either. a six-year-old. 
Does he use your he phone? Does, he does not have a phone. No. Does he use your phone? No. Not really. Hmm. Uh, but they also noted that 64% of children with autism spend more time engaging with electronic screens than other children. Okay. Do. That's true. I I could get behind that. And that's that. just a statement. That's not a judgment. Yeah. I can, I can see that. You know, I, I do see that pretty commonly that kids seem to know how to navigate (laughs) those devices and seem to really enjoy interacting with them so they felt that that might be a bonus as well it's also again not unheard of that kids have ipads that's true or other screen devices um like the ipad i could totally see that right because it's not which is weird because it's bigger i know but i i think as kids like watch shows on it yeah that seems less like I could totally see. A, I see tons of six year olds with iPads all over the place. Yeah. Maybe I'm just thinking of like my iPhone and I'm thinking of them like calling me <laughs> like, hey, like, I'm six. <laughs> what are you doing? I don't, but that would be weird. But if, the iPad, I, I, I'm there. Yeah. So it's the same idea. It's just yeah. a textual prompt, but it happens to be on the screen. And the other advantage is that it can change based on the that. situation, which is really a cool idea. It's like a spy novel. Right, like, say this, detective. It's like a bug in the ear yeah. type thing, right? That's yeah. What I meant. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I got you. Thank you. I'm going to class you up. Say it's more like Cyrano de Bergerac. Oh, thank you. There you go. I don't even know what that means. Seriously? Nope. The guy with the long nose? They nope. made the Steve Martin made Roxanne based on that story? I'm yawning right now. I'm I, don't, sorry, I don't mean to bore you with my No, I have my no references. idea we're talking about, though. I remember I know no references if they're not oh, Hallmark that's right. movies. That's right. It's not a Hallmark movie. <laughs> It's an old movie, though. It's an like 80s movie. P.S. Serial Nerd Bird Rack's even older. Sidetrack, Rob bought me holiday um, <laughs> four Hallmark movies for Christmas. It's the perfect gift. I did. <laughs> it's a good one. Cyrano is, is the guy whispering the lines or the guy receiving the No, whispered? he whispers the lines. Okay. But he's he's unattractive. Right. To Roxanne. Right. You've seen. It, it, I have seen it. I just, you've probably it's been a seen while. it done on like Saved by the Bell or any yeah, awful I've seen like there. teen movie oh, where yeah, somebody totally. somebody smart whispers into somebody good looking but dumbs either in there in the bushes or in an earpiece and now you would do it on a phone. Yeah, I love I'm sure that. They've done that with a Bluetooth headset at yeah, this point. Yeah, absolutely. They should have put that in the title of this one. <laughs> so you're no debergeracking social skills. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. It sounds weird. Okay. Okay, Uh, so in this study, they did four things. The first thing was they wanted to evaluate the use of a text message prompt, uh, which hadn't really been done previously. Next, they wanted to evaluate how well they could increase conversational uh, speech during play. It was also in the home, which I think is always nice to note because there's not as many studies done in the homes as in the natural setting. That's nice. And additionally, it was initially taught with an adult, but then uh, also taught with a sibling or a peer. So that's good to know, too, because that always adds a wild card factor uh, when you have other children involved. Uh, They also included generalization to new settings and peers. And finally, they also included a social validity component. Hmm. And it wasn't just like, wasn't like a throwaway social validity questionnaire. It was like a real deal. So I'll tell you about that when we get there. In this study, there were six participants. They were aged six to ten. Jake was 10 larry was seven landon was seven i love that name i do too rory was six julie was six and aaron was six a a ron you mean (laughs) you uh missed the conversation i had the other day um where i noted that elvis presley's middle name was aaron but it's only with one a oh yeah interesting all had a diagnosis of autism and all had a sibling Within six years of their age, either older or younger, it's kind of funny to think that like a seven-year-old might have done this with a one-year-old sibling. I don't. They didn't specify <laughs> yeah. the ages of the sibling, so all of them had a sibling that qualified to participate, except Landon. So for Landon, they recruited a peer. All children spoke in four to five word utterances. They all could read sentences that were six words in length, with the exception of Rory, who could read three words in length. And to determine this, they did several uh, initial assessments with them, but to determine uh, their reading ability, they did a reading assessment in which they presented 10 phrases on a phone, and they were all phrases that were related to game playing or things like that. And they checked to see how many of those they could read verbatim. 
the needed to read at least two of the ten phrases to participate in the study. And for Rory, he didn't read any that were longer than three words, so they limited the ones that they presented to him in the text messages to three words. But it was no problem because he could do that. So everyone here was vocal verbal and also could read. So that's good to note because it certainly limits some of the generality of the study. The materials that they used were regular old toys and games as you might find in your children's play area and the setting was the children's home and then for generalization there was also a rec center. There were two dependent variables number of scripted phrases and number of unscripted phrases. As I always mention that sounds super simple until you start trying to determine what counts as an unscripted or scripted phrase? Right. Right? Either type of phrase had to be contextually appropriate, first of all. So they Supported. Right. So they could say anything that was related to the materials or the interaction, and that was fine. The non-example they gave was someone yelling, turkey hot dogs! <laughs> Out <laughs> of context. I bet that happened. Right. I think it's probably <laughs> a real-life example. So that did not count. Scripted phrases had to either match the script provided on the text message verbatim, or could only differ in terms of pronouns, articles, conjunctions, or prepositions. And then unscripted phrases had to be appropriate, <laughs> so not turkey hot dogs, and did not match the text script. At all? So if it differed more than the pronouns, the articles, right. the prepositions, or whatever the other one was, right. the conjunction, then it was considered... Unscripted. Unscripted. I, I so the example fair. was, I like Candyland was the text prompt, and they said, I want to play Candyland. That was considered unscripted. I think that's fair. Yeah. I mean, you have to draw the line somewhere. Right. And trying to determine these things is, it always sounds so simple on paper, but it's not yeah, it simple sounds, at all. It still actually sounds like a nightmare. Yeah. So luckily, they only had those two dependent variables, which I think was smart on their part. This was a concurrent multiple baseline design. Ooh. I know. Um, so that was fancy. And it was a multiple baseline design across participants. And then additionally, this was not part of the multiple baseline design, but I wanted to note that the different scripts that they were provided were three different types. So they had questions, comments, and responses that they were being prompted to say, and they did vary. So in baseline, toys and games were present. There was a cell phone present, but there were no texts or written instructions provided on the cell phone. And then uh, the sibling or peer was present, and they were just instructed, just respond to questions or comments that are given to you by the target child. Um, other than that, nothing was provided as far as the instructions go. Again, those two dependent variables were measured. Uh, from there, they moved on to training Okay, it involved manipulating the phone, receiving the text, so making sure you can navigate to the part where it has the text button, and then saying the context of the text in conversation. They also had an elaborate plan in place for any unexpected texts that could occur. It's amazing. Like, hello, Bobby. Right? Yeah. <laughs> How are you? So they asked the dads, because it's, it's all the mom's phone, so they asked the dads not to text. That's so funny. During the training times. They had some method of blocking favorites from coming in. They said, oh, you can do this on your phone. I don't know. Oh. I've never tried that. And they said if something else were to come through, then they had a script in place that the experimenter was going to say, like, oh, this, this text didn't come from me, so you don't need to read it. Oh. But it never happened after all of that Phew. work that they put into place, right? But, yeah. I mean, that's a that's something you have to think about, right? Oh, yeah. Because then you, like, look up and the kid's like, don't worry, we can meet at Bed Bath & Beyond. Right. You have a dental appointment on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Reply stopped. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, it was good that they made that plan. And the training sessions, they described it in the context of a two hour session, but they only worked on this particular skill for two or three times for five minutes each time. So, I think it was in the context of a, like a larger, you know, ABA session that they were receiving. During the training, the end goal was that the child received eight texts and read out the phrases that were on those texts mm -hmm. accurately. And then they had a prompting hierarchy in place where there would be a 10-second delay verbal prompt. However, it was not needed. They also mentioned that the kids basically already knew how to navigate the phones <laughs> for the most part. Oh, good. 
All right. So once they went through all the training to, of how to receive those texts and then, you know, say the prompt within the context of play, that part should be noted, too. It's not just sitting. They were just sitting there reading the prompt. They had to, you know, still be engaging with the activity. Uh, then they moved on to the testing phase. And in this phase, there was no cell phone present. They had two five-minute sessions in which they tested to see whether the child engaged in, on their own in appropriate conversational phrases. If they did not, they returned to training. And if they did, then they moved on to the generalization phase. And they did this up to two times. And only one participant did not independently move on to the generalization phase, and that was Jake. So for Jake, they implemented script fading uh, to fade back how much of the phrase was texted the phrases changed each time, so they noted that too. That's cool. Yeah. So, you know, initially the entire phrase would be present. Then the next time it was a different phrase, but only three quarters of it would be present, half, etc. And that worked for him. Uh, so then following that testing phrase where they were all independently stating conversational phrases without the cell phone present, they moved on to a generalization phase. Again, these were five-minute probes, and they either occurred with the same peer who they had already been practicing with, but in a new setting. So they used a community rec center where none of the participants had been before. Or they remained in the home, so the setting was the same, but they brought in a new peer. Tested for the same things. And then for a follow-up, they did that one month later to see how well the skills were maintained. And I promised you guys I would tell you about social validity study. Mm -hmm. Go right? Ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what they did here... I thought this was cool. They recruited 20 mothers of elementary school aged children who were completely unrelated to the study. They had them all view 24 clips, uh, five minute clips. This is like an intensive thing for these participants as well. Yeah. 24 five minute clips. Some of them were pre-training. Some of them were post-training and asked them a series of, I think about seven questions, which they could rate one to seven, including things like how interested does this child seem to be in play? Would their own child be interested in playing with this peer? I like that. Because my thought when I was reading this, is like, I wonder how much typically, like for an age, like a six-year-old, how, ma how many interactions do they actually make, typically developing right. kids mm -hmm. make? So this would kind of get at that. Kind of, but not really. Maybe. But a little bit. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know how they chose eight. I'm not sure. They didn't, they didn't say if that was based on any type yeah. of probe but all right so there are two sort of two patterns of uh, results here so the first pattern is larry aaron and jake and for these participants uh, initial baseline in the regular setting the generalization setting and the generalization peer conversational phrases were low throughout all of those settings in training with the adult partner uh, responding increase for all participants and then when the sibling or peer was introduced uh, responding decreased for uh, Larry and Jake and for Aaron it remained higher so for Larry and Jake they returned to training uh, Jake was the one as I mentioned who needed the script fading practice so uh, for him they added in a bonus bonus sessions where they faded the script out and then following that they were able to move on to the testing phase and results in the generalization settings were moderate, I would say. They're not quite as high as they were in the initial testing phases, uh, but they were higher than baseline. So really, Larry and Jake are the two that have differing data. And then the other three participants, Julie, Landon, and Rory, responding during baseline remained low across participants in training. We saw in two to three data points, so a very short period of time, responding increase. When the sibling or peer was brought in, uh, responding increased even higher. And then from there, they, they did not need to go back and do additional training. They passed out of that and into the generalization and follow-up sessions. And again, generalization follow-up follow -up was a little bit lower than the training and the testing sessions, but again, higher than baseline. It looks pretty good. I mean, yeah. one of them was making 18 conversational phrases to his year. Right? So yeah. that's a lot. Yeah, that's pretty high. Mm -hmm. That's very high. In five minutes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So five minutes. And it only, uh, for these guys, this these 
ladder guys that I mentioned, they only practiced in the training sessions two to four times. That's awesome. It's like a dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> cool. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so they also mentioned, this isn't reflected because the, uh, the data that we have here are just overall number of conversational phrases. So, of course, that's the next question that you ask, right, is how much of it was scripted versus unscripted. So right. they don't have those data in the same format, but they mentioned that overall unscripted phrases increased, scripted phrases decreased over time. They included the unscripted phrases as a mean across phases for each participant in table two. So you can really see the numbers increase over time. So for everyone in their initial training sessions, the number of unscripted phrases was between zero and 50%. And then in the generalization and follow-up sessions, it was between 75 and 100% for everyone. So those were all unscripted. So they all saw some really nice improvements. And I thought it was a neat study because they were able to fade out so quickly yeah. uh, the use of the text message, which is, again, I think surprising. Um, you know, we know some about these participants. We know that they were fairly verbal. Uh, so it could be that they just needed the opportunity to see these types of phrases and then were able to integrate them into their play with a, with a peer. I don't know if something like this had been tried with them before using a different medium. Right. Uh, that would help. Right. But we know that this worked well for this particular group with this particular medium, which I think is cool. Yeah, I like that. Well, that's two of our, two of us going through our, our grab bag articles. Uh, I'm going to go next. But before we do that, let's take a quick break so we can refill the old grab bag. We'll be right back. Hey, ABA Inside Trackers, it's me, Jackie. And it's me, Diana. Jackie, I'm really excited to be joining you in this commercial because I've also started my career path at Regis. Yay! Yes, that's right, folks. If you want to start an exciting career in applied behavior analysis, you should check out the Master's and Certificate Program in Applied Behavior Analysis at Regis College. You can learn from both Diana and me. Here are some interesting facts about our program. 90% of our 2016 graduates passed the BCBA exam during their first time taking the exam. We think this is a really great testament to the program. We started an on-campus autism center in fall 2017. The center provides behavior analytic services to children diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder right at Regis College. The center will offer employment opportunities for some of our graduate students. Students working at the center will receive partial tuition remission. We also offer opportunities for paid clinical placements and graduate assistantships starting in the student's first year. So all of our grad students are currently working in the field, either part-time or full-time. Yes, we help students identify their practicum placements because we think it's imperative students receive excellent training and experience in the application of behavior analysis. Therefore, we screen placements to ensure students receive high-quality practicum placements. We are approved by the BACB to provide intensive practicum. Students complete at least 750 hours, but most complete much more over the course of three semesters. Across that time, students complete a professional portfolio that includes completing a variety of application exercises, and, such as conducting assessments, developing behavior plans, training curriculum, and more. This portfolio functions as a way to ensure students are learning the essentials of being an effective behavior analyst and is a great way to showcase your work at job interviews upon graduation. I love it. Students enroll in two courses per semester and graduate in a little under two years. Our courses are offered in traditional classroom and hybrid formats, which enables a student to focus on one course at a time while still completing the program quickly. All of the faculty are PhD level BCBAs with strong applied and research backgrounds in ABA and all have published papers in respected peer reviewed journals. We ensure small class sizes so that all students receive personalized attention from their professors and advisors are easily accessible to meet with students. 
There is also an invited lecture series at Regis, which involves inviting outside experts in ABA to speak on specialized topics relating to practicing ABA. And these are really great opportunities for students to learn from a variety of experts in the field, in addition to their professors. And last summer, we completed an international service trip to Iceland, which we plan to do every other year. Although we train students to work effectively with individuals diagnosed with autism, we also have opportunities for students to work with individuals with a variety of diagnoses and typically developing individuals as well. In addition, the coursework covers the broad applications of ABA with respect to solving socially important problems. There are opportunities for students to be involved in faculty research as well. We have a great location. We're just 12 miles from the center of Boston. So check us out at www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. Keep responding. And we're back, and I've refilled the grab bag, so now it's my turn. I think we're running a little long, so I'm going to try to go Sorry, quickly through fault. whatever I pick. No, that, that's it. Okay, I just got happens. too excited. We get excited. We talk. So please stop me if I if I start rambling or making no sense because I I don't want to I don't want to give the article short shrift, but I also don't want this to be a two hour podcast. All right, here we go. Ready? What is a shrift? Shrift? It's like a dress? That's a shift. <laughs> that's awesome i like, love shift dresses by the way they're my favorite dresses but i don't know what a shrift is i, I, I always assumed it was like a shrike like a little like a shrew or something i don't but know what those are either it is. i'll look it up later creepy looking look thing. It up now. anyway here we go ah my article teaching children with autism to respond to disguised mans by Najowski, Bergstrom, Tarbox, and St. Clair from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2017, the fall edition. So this is this is relatively recent stuff. Okay, short shrift, barely adequate time for confession before execution. <laughs> wow. Shrift oh, okay. is confession to a priest. Oh, okay, great. Wow. So it's not a dress that's too short, which is what I always thought. <laughs> no, a shift dress are not too short. It shouldn't be because you don't want to have a short shrift. <laughs> oh, <ew. laughs> oh goodness! The 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 gist of the article here is we're looking at the sense that most or I don't want to say most excuse me a lot of students a lot of children with autism on the autism spectrum have deficits in basic and complex language. Uh, you see this even with children who are more high functioning. They'll often have trouble with non-literal language. So that would be language like humor or sarcasm or deception is kind of cited in this article or what we'll mostly be talking about in this in this research indirect requests. And basically, non-literal language refers to language in which the intended meaning of the language is unclear. So we all know attack would be water bottle, because I see a water bottle. But if I go, great job, in a weird tone of voice, I might be using sarcasm to express that I am not tacting an actual great job so much as a bad job. <laughs> which can be kind of tricky to understand. So true. When, you know, if you have a disability which makes makes complex language very challenging for you to understand without say additional training or practice so uh when you look at what what the indirect requests or what non-literal language is from the kind of skinnerian verbal behavior standpoint you're talking about language in which you've got um the meaning that you has a, you as a listener have to take from what is being spoken uh comes from controlling variables that aren't readily apparent to the listener so you 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 do you don't have a full picture as to what is being said. Right. You have to you have to in, kind of intuit it pretty much. Like when I go to the store, and I'm like, oh man, I haven't had a Starbucks in a really <laughs> long time. When I go to Starbucks, yeah. when I go to Target, and yeah. I I want Matt to is this a man to yourself? Oh, Matt, that, that would be that yeah. would be a good example. <laughs> or to myself, man. I might say that to myself too. I deserve this. <laughs> I haven't had one since yesterday. <laughs> yeah, then that would be a disguised man, possibly to yourself. <laughs> or if you have no money and you know you can't get a Starbucks, then it's a magical man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Creators, but you know it's not going to happen. <laughs> you awesome. make it to the barista. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really haven't had Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> that would be amazing, but I don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of the overall non-literal language piece, there's been a lot of research looking at uh, teaching correct responding to idioms using like stories and teaching uh, teaching the participants to match the correct picture based on what story they learned, what idiom was used. 
Uh, but a lot of the training and research done for children with ASD looks at the idea of multiple exemplar training. So you have a set of exemplars you assess before and after training a couple of those exemplars so that you can test for generalization to those untrained exemplars. So basically you have a subset of them that you practice so that you get enough of them that, hey, it general the skill generalizes to a whole bunch of other exemplars that are similar to those original exemplars. Persicky? I'm not sure if that's how it's pronounced, but he'd done a lot of research that this is an extension of where he looked at giving, actually, I don't even know if it's a, it's a he or she, but the Persigi looked at giving rules and feedback to the participants to teach appropriate responding in terms of teaching metaphors and for appropriate listener responding to sarcasm, which I loved. They give a quick example where someone would say, nice shot. And then you'd have to, I think they used videos on that of like watching someone shooting a basket into a basketball and your response would be to laugh at nice shot or to you know make a positive comment about nice shot so i'm guessing they had a video of like someone totally whiffing and missing and someone says <laughs> nice shot and i guess the appropriate response is to laugh at that i feel like that's not the greatest response all the time with sarcasm because if someone says that to you my response wouldn't be ha ha it would be who, who the hell do you think you are jerk you sarcastic meanie that's what I would say, I think. You sarcastic meanie? I'm you pretty sure that's not yeah, what that's exactly what you'd say. Uh, that's probably what I'd say. <laughs> that's exactly what you'd say, Rob. <laughs> that's, thank you. Yes, it is. I'm glad you agree. <laughs> so uh, when we talk about our indirect requests, one of the challenges here, uh, especially when we're talking about the idea of the disguised manned, is that the manned has a different topography from that direct request. So if I say, I want water, that's a simple manned. I clearly want water. You you, you hear it as, as a listener. Oh, I heard the term water and want. Therefore, I know what you're kind of, I know the establishing operation going on. You're deprived of water and you would like some water. So I will deliver water to you. However, with the disguise manned, you don't have that same, that, that topography is not there because I'm not going to say I want water so much as like, oh, I'm so thirsty. Or, Oof, I'm parched. Or this flower is Wilson or some, something along those lines. And my response doesn't actually specify what is the reinforcing consequence that I actually want. And there's some kind of fun discussion as to why would we use disguised man's society? Because isn't it much more direct to just be like, I want water. And then I mm -hmm. get water. And the reason explained here is, well, it's possible that as a verbal community, and they, they, they put the blame of this on parents, when our children say things like, or when ch individuals say things like, I want a thing, especially when it's to a, a brand new person or novel individual, right. we're con we often consider that to be very rude. So I want candy to your parents is sort of like, oh, that's kind of annoying. But if you went up to a stranger who just happened to have candy and said, I want candy, then you would say, oh my God, Billy, I can't believe you said that. That is so rude. You don't ask for that. So we actually probably punish a lot of the direct demands that we hear. Hmm. as listeners where it varies society or culture to culture so that you're right Diana. it certainly could vary from culture to culture but at least in this case typically at least in in north america if you just sort of directly man for items you're often told you're very rude however mm -hmm. if you respond as a listener to a disguised man that's often considered to be really oh how kind and considerate you're being you know that person said they were cold and you gave them a blanket that shows that you're a good person that is so true. we actually do respond we probably respond much more to the disguised mans than we do to direct mans which is why we often make so many disguised mans rather than direct mans even though direct mans would just be much easier for everyone to understand exactly what it is that is being requested therefore you know speakers probably are less likely to just use direct mans so when you look at typically developing kids, by 13 months, most children are able to give an item to a caregiver when the caregiver puts their palm up. By 18 months, they can differentiate if they gave the right item to someone based on their facial expression. So if they give you an item and you make a sad face, they, they'll, they'll give you the other item. And by four years, it's usually when you'll see children able to respond correctly or accurately to disguised demands. Hmm. So that, and that, was just, that was just the introductory. I just thought it was interesting enough to, to add here. Yeah, by four, that seems young yeah but i mean I when you not. when you watch when you watch kids developing language it is like a, it is a magical thing can't wait it's hard it's hard not to, it's hard not to blame the chomps guys for saying magical you've got <laughs> language in your brain because there's no other way to explain how complicated and amazing it, it is amazing it is absolutely amazing that's not how it is but i'm, I'm just saying i get it i understand yeah. why one might think it's it's, right. a, it's just built into your brain because it's Don't so talk about so chomsky amazing. <laughs> just, just saying bad word <laughs> 
So this study specifically was going to teach children with autism spectrum disorder a generalized repertoire of responding to disguised mans. Not only would they train them to respond to disguised mans, but they would also demonstrate that that training, the use of multiple exemplar training, would allow them to respond to novel disguised mans as well. So they used a multiple exemplar package with given rules, role play, and feedback as part of the training. The participants were three young boys with ASD. They were getting home services, so home behavioral interventions. They uh, all spoke in full sentences. They were able to engage in all verbal operants. They had also done a lot of similar social skills training to learn skills like safety prevention, uh, crossing the street, how to respond to strangers, and all except for, I think, one, one session was run at home. One session was run in an amusement park, the ultimate test of generalization. So the response that the experimenters were looking for was just a pretty much a swift response to that disguised band. So in baseline, it was 10 seconds, but for all other conditions, pretty much someone made a disguised band and they should respond appropriately within three seconds and then complete the action related to that man within 30 seconds. So if I said, I'm cold, they'd say something like, I'll get you a blanket and then get me a blanket. Give me a blanket within 30 seconds. So if you're in an amusement park and someone says, it's so fluffy, they have you to give you a unicorn. unicorn. <laughs> exactly. The procedure, pretty much, they'd run these kind of 45 to 60 minute session, one to two days a week during their regularly occurring activities. Uh, during the baseline and post-training, they were pretty much the same procedure. They only ran five trials. During training, they'd run 10 trials. Uh, they had whatever items were needed. So, again, if someone's disguised man was going to be... Because it was all kind of semi-random from a list of 20, 20 disguised mans. If it was something like, I'm hungry, then they wouldn't have food. But if they were going to say something like, that cookie smells so good, <laughs> I love that. then they had to have a cookie present because it would be bizarre otherwise. And they had all these other extra adults because they wanted to also try to promote generalization across people. So they'd have the experimenter and then they'd bring their kind of adult friends along. So they had also all these other adults around. They that didn't do the creepy. training. Like you do. They just, they just bring some. I, you know, oh, I've just brought a friend with me today. Um, and that, but that was just in the baseline and the post in the post training components. So during baseline, you'd have five different disguised mans from their list of 20. And every five to 10 minutes, they had some downtime. They'd mention how cold they were, how hungry they were, whatever the disguised man happened to be. I like this about the baseline. If the student, if the children did nothing, then, oh, well, nothing happened. No consequences. I like that. Baseline. However, if the participant responded like affirmatively, like, oh, so you want a blanket? Or they responded appropriately by giving the experimenter or whoever made the disguised man that gave them, gave them what they were manding for, they would say thank you. And they would kind of comment on it. So it, it wasn't a baseline in the sense that there was no differential uh, you know, consequences. However, I think that's more natural that you wouldn't just necessarily, if, they, if you're like, I'm cold and the kid gets you a blanket, you just sort of stare into space, you would you'd probably say something. So I, I understood that. Yeah, uh, I'm all for providing reinforcement during baseline. I mean, I know people go both ways. Mm-hmm. On that, but the you know the argument for doing that is that if someone were to learn something during the course of baseline just through social reinforcement, then that's not likely something you need to embark on an entire yeah. training program <laughs> for. So yeah, if they if they can learn it in two trials because you said good job, then hey, right, exactly, great. That's not a problem anymore. The experimenters would start with a pre-training session where they'd provide a rule, so they'd give, they'd give a rule to the participants. They'd say, you know, sometimes when a person wants something, they give hints about what they want instead of just asking for it. And then they gave an example where if someone's lying down on the floor and wants a pillow, they'd say, this isn't very comfortable with my head just lying on the floor. You know, as you do when you lie on the floor, you make general statements about how crappy it is to sleep on a floor. Maybe you should get a pillow. And then they'd practice with a prompt. So then they'd actually lie down on the floor and say, you know, oh, my head, this, this hurts. This is uncomfortable. And then they'd practice. And then if the participant didn't do something within three seconds or respond within three seconds, they'd say, what I'm really saying is I want a pillow. So you should ask me if I want a pillow. And they'd pretty yeah. much just, just play out the whole, mm-hmm. you know, kind of the whole, <laughs> whatever kind of private thoughts you'd probably be going through in terms of, in terms of uh, responding to that disguised man. 
And they'd practice this until they got two correct consecutive responses during that role play. And then they'd start the official training, which wasn't really training so much as they just introduced disguised mans into the into their sessions. So they'd pick two from that list of 20. Mm -hmm. They were topographically different from the ones, the, the mans that were going to be used in the baseline, or had been used in baseline and would be used in post-treatment. They were functionally the same, though. So instead of saying, that food looks really good, they'd say, that food looks delicious, which is exactly the same function you know of the mm -hmm. disguised man however it's topographically different and they sort of just randomly pick two they semi randomly present them throughout their sessions if the participant responded appropriately and got the item that was being requested within 30 seconds they get praise if they didn't respond within three seconds they get a prompt like so what do you think that person wants because the experimenter was not the one making the disguised man during okay. these training sessions yeah. it, was, it was the friend that they randomly brought into their house <laughs> And then the you know, participant would usually say something like, oh, I think they want to eat something. Okay, you should ask her if she wants to eat something or ask her that. And then the therapist, if, they can, if the participant continued to not respond appropriately to the man, then the therapist would give them an additional vocal model of what they should ask. Um, they mentioned no one ever needed more prompting than that, though. So that was a, apparently a very successful prompt, which is going to kind of lead into one of the main limitations of the study, namely, right. wow, this seems really, really easy is this going to have a lot of external validity? And they even yeah. mentioned that mm -hmm. based on what the who the participants are in this study. Sure. And they would continue on with these this training. If the participant did need multiple prompts, so two 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 prompts, they'd repeat that initial rule. Like remember, when someone comes into the house, you know the the, the person who comes into the house today, they're going to ask for something, but they might not say exactly what it was. And so that's how they pretty much start all the all the sessions or during the training time, which I totally forgot to say that. Sorry, everyone. They'd start with that kind of general rule. Cool. Um, it's a life rule. It's yeah. A good, it's a good life rule. I like it. If the participant uh, responded appropriately with 70% accuracy within a session, they'd add two more disguised mans in the next session. So the next session, they'd have four disguised mans that they'd semi-randomly have this stranger they brought with them present. And this really was only relevant for their for their graph. So they'd, they'd graph it on a separate line as, as new untrained, new untrained probe. So were they all called. bringing the person something? Yeah, they, they all, it was either an action or they'd give them an item. So some, I think it was one about like uh, as a keyboard, like, oh, it's so hard to type from this angle was the disguised man. And so, oh, I should give you the keyboard or let you go to the keyboard. There was one about smell. They tried to go across you know, okay. different different sense senses as well as items and places like the amusement park they just happen to be at amusement park I know, they, that's they just use the hilarious. same toy i don't know what the, what they were practicing at the amusement park. i love like that. field day right <laughs> I, I guess i mean I th it seemed like it was one-to-one -one session so this I, kid just happened to go to the amusement park that day i feel jealous <laughs> so he's working on amusement park skills <laughs> they're waiting in line for five hours for the roller coaster <laughs> right kid. hey while we're waiting sure is hot <laughs> I love water. cotton candy. <laughs> it's. I wish I could smell your cotton candy. <laughs> would you like to smell my cotton candy? Oh, thank you. I would. <laughs> Little boy, do you know this man? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, kid. I'm a stranger. I sure could use a hug right now. I'm so lonely. <laughs> so amazing. Need to hug you, strange man? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> that's, that's, you didn't generalize your stranger danger. Yeah, right. From previously. Ooh. All right. So when you would get, uh, so they considered mastery to be three consecutive sessions with at least eighty percent correct responding on all the trials and a hundred percent correct responding on those first trial generalization probes. So bam, it's a brand new, it's a brand new disguise man I'm adding in here. And what they would do before they went to post training was they'd have a, a novel person. So this is where they included, they'd include like a brand new person. Okay, who the, that makes sense. The participant had never seen before. Post training was pretty much just the baseline procedure, except they'd have new people and they'd go back to that or that manned topography that they used in baseline. So the mans had a different topography than the students had been trained on. So they were same function, disguised mans, but they were technically novel because they weren't the exact same words. And when you look at the results, you know, when you look at the graphs, they have everything graphed by sessions and then by present recording. They used a non concurrent multiple baseline design across the three participants. And, you know, in baseline, the, you know, one of the participants is just really nothing, no responding. One of them's kind of was about 20% correct responding. The other one actually did show a bit of an increase, but again, really didn't go any higher than a few, few times kind of responded 40% correctly within those sessions. 
And then when they began the training themselves, uh, as they noted, all participants showed a rapid increase in their ability to accurately respond to the disguised mans. And that was really true. Uh, they they sort of varied in terms of how long, but they were all within a, a reasonable amount. You know, I think for, for the longest was 10 sessions for one participant to get to that mastery criteria. And for uh, five sessions was the shortest. So not a very long time at all. I mean, mm -mm. These, these were longer sessions, but they weren't training for that full chunk of time. They were, they were training within those, within those sessions. And usually the first trial probes, they weren't always, you know, 100% until the end. Although, you know, again, the, the student who responded within five sessions was getting those first trial probes really fast. The other ones took a little bit longer to uh, respond to them with 100% uh, correct responding. I and like first trial probes. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a good way to sort of move through your exemplars. See what's going on. I mean, especially with something like multiple exemplar training, you got to get as many exemplars out there as possible. Yeah. Or else it's, it really defeats the purpose right. of the name. There's no multiple. <laughs> uh, when they went into post-treatment, they, again, had high, accurate responding for all the participants. Again, a few of them went down to 80% a few times, but almost all of them were 100%. They had the one generalization at the amusement park, which was 100% correct uh, and accurate responding. You know, again, they, they didn't stretch it out too, too, too long, but post-treatment results were all very, very strong. So they learned the skill using this methodology. So in the discussion section, the one of the main limitations that was brought up was, well, were we just lucky in having the three best students we could ever hope to benefit from this treatment package? They just happened to have all the operants they needed, and they they were sensitive to this type of treatment, so it worked for them. Maybe it wouldn't work for anyone else, which, again, that's a great limitation. It's not really fair to blame the researchers for that. How how would they know? Right. So you would need to be looking at what are the components. That's why you replicate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, are, what are the sort of, not exactly components, but what are the prerequisites right. for using uh, using skills skills training package like this? Sure. I, I like it that. Would be, you would have you know a pretty complex verbal repertoire for this to be effective and yeah. social repertoire and social repertoire. Yeah. I mean, some a training like this would have, you know, probably want to show would be effective with simpler tasks. Yeah. So, I mean, stranger danger. So not going with a stranger isn't exactly the easiest task to train, but at the same time, it's more straightforward. I think than responding to disguised demands in terms of this yeah. person, you know, if it's not, don't walk away with them. Right. So maybe that would be a, a, a good kind of pretest to see before for using this like you're not just going to use this for a student who has two mans total in their own repertoire this of course would not be effective yeah hmm. there was a lot of discussion too so uh, those of you who are interested in the idea of disguised mans as to what you know how do disguised mans work and it did go a lot into the idea that we have to be able to sort of understand the idea of pri other people's private events. So not only do we have to pay attention to some of the language that they're using, mm -hmm. so the form of the language, but we also probably have to be looking at what are the stimuli in our environment that kind of clue us into like, oh, those words correlated with these events must mean yeah. hot or cold or hungry. And some of them are probably easier in that sometimes the disguise man itself would name the EO. So I haven't eaten all day is very clearly related to the idea of food. Therefore, it's pretty easy to understand. Aha! Yeah, so if you, you were like... You were thinking, I want food. Or you're like, oh, you need a nap? Yeah. Yeah, that would be funny. There are also some other ideas of, well, could this have something to do with relational frame theory? And if we had more time, I might spend a little more time talking about it. I'll just say, if you're interested in that discussion, you should go... Uh, read the article itself because it's it's a little beyond what, what we're talking about here. Uh, again, the other limitation too was they didn't really go through all 20 of the disguised mans. So it is unclear whether maybe the participants had some uh, familiarity with these. They didn't actually know how they'd respond to all of these mans. Oh. So it's possible they could have responded to the mans uh, without training. So maybe the results had more to do with the fact they already knew these mans. But again, they did go through a number of the mans, the disguised mans, and their baseline res results were very low. So right. it's it's uh, not that not that strong. However, it was a you know, method methodological limitation. That sure, that the makes researchers sense. Researchers wanted to bring up. I'm glad they did. Mm -hmm. And they only did the one test at the amusement park, so more amusement park testing is needed. <laughs> I, I will sign up to be that data collector at the amusement park. All right, and that is the study on disguised man. Cool. I think with all of our research articles, we kind of stopped at the dissemination station along the way. So the end is just keep reading, guys. Yeah. That's right. We, we probably want to give our second secret code word. What is it, Rob? It's Bell. B-E-L-L. -L. 
like the thing you ring, the jingle bell, actress Kristen Bell from Frozen. She's not from Frozen. She was in Frozen. Yeah. She was Anna. <gasps> what? Yeah, her and Adina Menzel. Huh, I did not Adele know that. Adele Cool. Bell. That's it for this episode. We went a little long, and we so no formal dissemination station, like Jackie said, because we should just just keep on reading. And if something interests you, well, no time to stop. Read it. Keep on rolling. That's right. I loved the idea of disguised man. So I saw that, and bam, that was my article. When I grabbed it from that bag, I just knew it was love at first sight. Love at first sight. Thank you so much for listening to ABA Inside Trek. We are a weekly podcast. We do a little preview episode in between weeks. And we do our full-length episodes every other week. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play. You can find us online as ABA Inside Track. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. And feel free to email us at abainsidetrack at gmail.com with any feedback or with article or topic suggestions. Again, if you'd like to get continuing education credits, you can find more about that on the website or on the info page of your podcast app. If you are listening to this, it means our switch to our new podcast provider went smoothly and I didn't break anything. So, hooray. And if you can't hear this, I have no way of knowing that. So, <laughs> oh, well. No one will ever hear us again, I guess. Thank you very much, Jackie. And thank you very much, Diana, for being here for another fun-filled grab bag episode. We'll have another one of these on episode 60. Ugh. That seems Not long. 60. What? Oh, and oh yeah, you're right. I mean, we, we'll have another episode before 60, I'm just saying. Gotcha. We won't, we won't have another one of these until 60. So, everyone, thanks for listening. Thanks again, co-hosts, for co-hosting. We'll be back next week with our preview episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye.